Welcome to the British Chamber of Commerce Singapore's podcast channel. We're excited to bring you season three of new episodes featuring in-depth content across Singapore, ASEAN and the United Kingdom. We've had some extraordinary guests on our channel, including Formula One's Claire Williams. I'm a firm believer that any great team, any successful team has a great culture flowing through it. You aren't successful if you don't. So we put a lot of work into this. Renowned mountaineer Kenton Cool. That 2019 there with a client, a big storm came in and literally destroyed Camp 2. And I've got some video footage of Sherpas like trying to hold on to the tent fabric as it blows away. And the Royal Navy's Commodore Steve Morehouse, commander of the UK Carrier Strike Group. The squadron of F-35 aircraft we have on board is a Royal Air Force squadron. And, and the personnel there are drawn from both the Navy and the Air Force. So it's a what better way of, of showing just the efficiency and the joined up nature that we now have. And distinguished Sky News anchor, Jeremy Thompson. We had two little vans with satellite links and we, le we leapfrogged up the road to Pristina, the capital, uh, throughout that first day with non-stop coverage from basically inside a war zone. We also sit down with the likes of TikTok, Twitch and Twitter and continue to bring you conversations around business and trade, leadership of people, sustainability, sports and arts and much, much more. Thank you, as always, for your support and we hope you enjoy this podcast. So hello everyone, my name is Oriana Bryan, your host and Associate Director of Sustainability at Mullen Low Salt, the creative agency. We're here today to launch the Journey to Sustainable Finance podcast series on behalf of the British Chamber of Commerce Sustainability Committee. Today we're going to hear from the exceptional Dr. Darian McBain. Chief Sustainability Officer at the Monetary Authority of Singapore about her journey to sustainable finance. What got her interested? What is happening today that she predicted might happen a decade ago? And what, in her opinion, needs to be prioritized by business and governments? Darian's here today because of the unique position she holds as an agent of change within the Singaporean and international regulatory system. So welcome, Darian, and also a thank you to the ESG Impact Hub in the great room for hosting us today. Hey, Ariana, lovely to be here, and thank you to the British Chamber of Commerce for hosting this event and also to the ESG Impact Hub, because we're here in this great podcast studio, so I've been itching <laughs> to test it out. Yeah, very professional. Um Great. So to start us off, I'd really like to hear about your story and your call to leadership. Really, what drew you to the world of sustainable finance? Was there a specific moment when you knew that the role of finance was essential in transforming our global systems to create this sustainable future? So it's an interesting question and one that I get asked more frequently as someone who's always worked in sustainability. So my journey starts way, way, way back. I studied environmental engineering in the 1990s in Australia. So I've always worked in the environmental space. And then I moved to the UK and I worked for the National Health Service uh, for a while and for the purchasing and supply agency. So I really got into supply chains and how supply chains and procurement could change sustainability because it was changing people's purchasing decisions. And if you could encourage people to buy things more sustainably, and particularly at a large scale, um, then it would have an impact on supply chains up and down the supply chains, but also globally. And I continued to pursue that for a number of years and including doing my PhD in supply chain analysis and I ended up working for a company called Thai Union, based out of Thailand, and it's one of the largest seafood processors in the world. So it uses wild-caught fish and aquaculture and produces feed, um, really to feed, help feed billions of people around the world, but global supply chains and a great opportunity to look at sustainability in oceans, but also human health and impact uh, looking at what we eat as a mechanism for sustainability as well, and a lot of work on human rights. And after doing that for several years, 
really we had a lot of work to do to make sure that we could be acceptable to civil society. We had a lot of NGO activists, but also government work and making sure that our customers, who are the large retail supermarkets, were happy. We started to look at sustainable finance. So at the time, we were looking at a green bond. But because of the use of proceeds, we couldn't quite see how to utilise it, and we could get a lower cost of capital from the local banks. And so it took a while for us to figure out how we could best utilise sustainable finance and really maximise the benefit of all of the sustainability work that we'd been doing in-house for a financial outcome. And we ended up working on a sustainability-linked loan. It was a syndicated loan. We had many different actors across this region working on that, and we launched the loan in 2021. And that was a great thing. It was hard to get to that sustainability-linked loan launch point. It had taken a lot of conversations. But at that time, my CEO said, finally, sustainability is paying off. And it really made me think, wow, all of this other work that we'd been doing for different stakeholders for many years had accumulated in finance being seen as the payoff. And that really was the point at which I thought, finance rather than procurement and supply chain is going to accelerate the pace of change. So it's not that the other work doesn't matter, but finance has the ability. It can be both a carrot and a stick. It can be a carrot if you can get either a lower cost of capital or you can perhaps get insurance based on your sustainability work that maybe you couldn't have gotten previously. Perhaps you would attract investors that you couldn't have attracted without your sustainability track record. That's the carrot side of sustainable finance. The stick will increasingly be tied to regulations around disclosures in particular, but also meeting standards. And eventually, there may be a case where if you're not able to prove your sustainability credentials, and particularly around commitments to net zero, it may be even more difficult to access finance. Mm -hmm. And so that, yeah. when that happens, will be the stick side of the equation. Yeah, that's really interesting. And um, just a follow-on question from that. I mean, finance is in such this period of transformation at the moment. Do you think financial... Uh, f financial professionals recognize their agency to change our economic systems? I think they're starting to, but everything from central banks down to more operational international banks and insurers and then investors are starting to see the power that they potentially have, although not all would agree it's a power for them to use. And if I look at sustainability professionals like myself who have worked in this arena for coming up to 30 years, so certainly 20 plus years, there's a lot of sustainability knowledge and the different aspects of sustainability. You know, even if we look at the sustainable development goals, you know, there are 17 sustainable development goals and there are many sub points within them. I think the financial industry is coming at it purely from a climate change perspective often and particularly from an energy transition perspective mm -hmm. and I can see that financial players can perhaps see their agency around financing to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and move towards net zero but when you take it out more broadly if we start to talk about a just transition so how can we make sure that people are brought along on that journey with us or a just nature transition. So how do we make sure that nature remains in balance? You know, we balance the risks of having significant impacts of natural systems breaking down, ecosystems breaking down with the benefits to the economy. I think once you start to go onto those broader areas, that's where a lot of people in finance start to struggle because it really is beyond uh, the skill set that they have to date, which is much more on the financial transactions. Mm. And that's maybe why we've seen such a, a focus on climate change, be, because it's something that you can really measure. You can measure the gas in the air, whereas with, uh, you know, biodiversity, for example, it's it's more fluid as to how you measure things and, and what, what the impact is in certainly different parts of the world. So it's uh, a, a little bit more 
random as to how uh, we achieve this transformation. I think that is so true. We've had the greenhouse gas protocols in place now for you know well over a decade, and so just that accounting methodology mm. is well known and can be understood, and it's numbers. And so even though there are variations, at least you can compare numbers with other numbers. But if you're looking at you know, biodiversity as a good example or what social equality or financial inclusion could mean it gets less tangible in terms of the hard statistics and it's going into some aspects of qualitative as well as quantitative numbers. Yeah, great. Um, really, really interesting your your transition from being a scientist into yeah working for Thai Union and, and now uh, in, in finance. So thanks for talking about your journey. Um, Leading us into the second question for today, I'd really like to know your point of view about what is happening in this field of sustainability that you predicted might happen 10 years ago. And now you said that you've been working in this area for 30 years, so uh, feel free to go beyond 10 years. Um, but yeah, really interested in, in uh, what, what your point of view is. I think the hardest thing for me to see is that we have known the signs, whether it's for climate change or biological biodiversity risks, for so many years and yet we haven't acted upon it. So if I go back to when I first was studying in the 1990s, I can remember reading Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring. I'm happy to say I wasn't alive when that book was first published. That was in the 1960s. But... That was very much referring to the impact of chemical pollution and pesticides on nature. So we had this construct of human activities can impact natural systems for many decades now. And when I was studying at university, climate change was actually the thing that we were being trained to do. Why were engineers being trained as environmental engineers? So I did around half of a civil engineering degree and the rest was a lot of environmental science. The main reason was because after the Rio Earth Summit and the Club of Rome reports, there was this recognition that climate change was a global challenge and we're going to need some hard technical solutions to get society into a better place. And I've been speaking about climate change for many years, as I said, almost decades, and I see the position we are now where now most people have had some physical impacts from climate change. Yeah. It's only gotten worse over the time when I've been doing this. It hasn't actually gotten better. Mm -hmm. And so I think what I would reflect on when you say, what have I predicted? I, I feel like I've been saying these terrible things will happen for decades now. And yet it's been very difficult to get traction unless there has been a financial payback. So energy efficiency would be a good example where a company can see that changing light bulbs or changing mm. processes will save them money on energy consumption. There has been some progress. But to accept that we need a wholesale change of our economy, which is based on a carbon economy, to something that is less carbon and will move us towards net zero, that has been a much slower realisation. And I think back to when I worked for the NHS in the UK, I can remember teaching people within the NHS about climate change, and this is why we needed to take action. And almost inevitably, the response was, it'll be great, it'll get warmer, we'll have longer summers, we can grow wine in England. Yeah. And it was so difficult to convince people that, no, no, this is a bad thing, it's not a good thing. And now we look at the summer that Europe has just had uh, with extreme droughts, extreme heat, uh, fires on certainly continental Europe. And I wonder if people are now starting to realise that uh, there's definitely a much bigger downside to climate change than perhaps we had thought before. Yeah, that's that's interesting. It makes me think about the question, you know, how do you change behavior? If you were talking to people, you know, and they were saying, oh, this is such a wonderful thing that's going to happen. And I, I've heard that before as well. There's also this, this question about, you know, to change behaviors of people, to make people see uh, these 
catastrophic uh, events, you know, before they really start to get to this tipping point where we can't reverse the effects of climate change. How do you how do you change these behaviors? Do you talk about the positive narrative or do you talk about the negatives or what do you think this balance, the right balance is between positive and negative? I think we have to speak in the language of hope because if we only look at the negative, then actually that takes away some of our agency. We just think about ourselves as individuals. If everything is doom and gloom, actually it feels like you can't do anything. And I was really struck, this is a bit of a, a random tangent, last year for the Singapore FinTech Festival, I got to interview uh, Yisheng Wong, who is now the CEO of Terraformation, but he came from tech in Silicon Valley. He was the CEO of Reddit, and he's worked at Facebook and various other organizations. And we were talking about Terraformation, which was his climate change startup. But we got on to, he was running a competition on solar punk art. And so I was asking him, what is <laughs> solar punk? Uh, and I started to do some research. And it's this vision for the future, which is optimistic. And actually, Singapore yeah. is really good at projecting these images. It's vertical gardens, it's yeah. solar and using water, reticulated systems, but it's a positive beautiful view of the future. It's different, but it's still beautiful, but it has that optimism built into it. And yeah. I do wonder if that's part of the challenge that we have with communicating climate change at the moment. It's always doom and gloom. And yes, it is very bad. I'm not trying to minimize that. But mm -hmm. actually, as humans, we switch off if all you're talking about is the negativity. Agreed. And so I do think as professionals working in climate change and sustainability and sustainable finance as well, we need to make sure that we emphasize that there is some optimism, that humans are, are clever, we can engineer our way out of some of these challenges, but we have mm. to take it seriously and we have to do something now, which yeah. is where I think finance can be that catalyst for change. If the only thing stopping us from moving towards a different low carbon solution is finance, then it shouldn't be the barrier. You know, we yeah. should be able to apply finance in that case. It's not the lack of understanding of what we need to do. Because sometimes coming up to the scientific solutions could be what takes us many, many years. But if it's just being able to apply the finance, then hopefully there's something that we can really accelerate. Yeah, and I, I completely agree with that hopeful, positive narrative. And when I was working at Forum for the Future, I was introduced to a book that Jonathan Porat wrote called The World We Made. And it was written through the perspective of a teacher looking back from 2050 to tell the story of how they got to where they were today to a much better place in the future. And I, when my colleagues gave me the book, and I just loved reading through it because it was all of these, all through different uh, facets of life. There were examples of, you know, how do you, how do you reach this more uh, positive future? What are the things that we did back in, I think it was 2020, uh, to reach this this better future? Um, but I just wonder, you know, if going back to this, we're talking about the future now, talk, getting back to 10 years ago, what do you think, do you think maybe the messages were too doom and gloom then and that didn't catalyze enough change or um, perhaps we were too hopeful then and people thought we had more time now? I think it's a combination of all of those things and until either individuals or people they know start to experience these changes for real, it doesn't really seem to have an impact. And I would reflect on you know, my home country is Australia. I went back to Sydney in December 2019 and the bushfires, so there were really significant bushfires in Australia. Anyone on the East Coast was impacted. Some people, of course, some people lost their lives. Many people lost their homes, mm. lost uh, many millions of 
hectares of native forests, native species. I mean, absolutely devastating. Yeah. That devastation really brought it home for a lot of people in Australia that this is real and actually it was uncontrollable. Those fires were uncontrollable, the likes of which had not been seen in Australia. And I think experiencing that partly led to an overturning of the Australian government in the election that happened yes. earlier this year. Mm -hmm. There was a very strong mandate to take action on climate change that perhaps hadn't been there before. Yeah. And then in Australia, just to continue, the opposite has happened. There have been the worst floods on the East Coast <laughs> that have ever been experienced. Yeah. And so again, people are realising climate change is not this one continuum. And I think that's part of the challenge that we have always said, if we do X, the result will be Y, and it's a gradual process. And yet now we're seeing the systems start to compound you know, the feedback mechanisms will help accelerate the changes and it's not as predictable and manageable as we first thought. And I do wonder if that's going to help us as a society uh, really increase the pace of change because that's what's needed now. Yeah, yeah really, uh, really interesting. Um, okay, so... You know, now we've talked about the past, um, moving into the future. Well, we have talked a little bit about the future as well, but uh, our final question today is knowing what you know now and the challenges the world faces, the choices that we must take at a global level, plus the urgency and the hope that we can aspire to, what do you think governments and multinationals need to prioritize first question and second question how do you think sustainable finance can make a substantial difference in this future world so i'd say it's a shared responsibility between governments and the corporate world I don't think you can have the corporate world coming up with all of the answers in the absence of government regulation. And to the point about sustainable finance, sustainable finance is a tool. It doesn't replace good regulation to encourage and move businesses and all of society in the direction that you need. So good, strong environmental regulations would be a good example. Um, sustainable finance, I don't think, can overcome the absence of strict environmental regulations to meet whatever criteria you are moving towards. That said, uh, from a financial regulation perspective, uh, requirements on disclosure to encourage companies, uh, listed companies and non-listed companies, to, to share what they're doing on sustainability, mm -hmm. to have comparable data and definitions is important so that we can see how we're making progress as a society and that you can compare across countries. So I think it's also very useful how you are seeing so many countries around the world setting their own net zero targets. You know, Singapore has said that it will aim to reach net zero emissions by around 2050. Yeah. I think this is important because there's a trickle down effect throughout the rest of society. If the government is saying, as a country, we need to reach net zero by a certain time, then businesses will need to all manoeuvre to also meet that. And then it comes down to individuals and the rest of civil society who also need to move towards that. And so I do think there's a role for governments to play uh, regulation, but also signalling the right direction of change. For businesses, they tend to be much more dynamic and able to be flexible and can come up with a lot of innovative solutions. And so you don't want everybody just to be sitting at the minimum, which is the regulated minimum. You also want the leaders to be innovating and showing a pathway forward. And that's where I think uh, the business community really does have an important role to play. Um, and then you have civil society, whether it's the NGOs, the non-government organisations or academia, um, they have an important role to play as well in both pointing out where our challenges are, but also highlighting some of the solutions which may not have been brought into practice yet, 
but they need to flag up what those issues are and where the solutions are lying. Yeah, just going into that um, point you mentioned about what is the minimum that businesses can do. I mean, there's even uh, some criticism about, for example, science-based targets and that being seen as, uh, you know, if businesses want to go even beyond that, they aren't pushed far enough and science-based targets, even though it's more aspirational than most businesses would even reach, it's being seen as a, uh, as a stop, I guess, and, and, and uh, uh, break for innovation, more innovation that businesses could have. So what are your thoughts on, uh, on those different tools and, um, I guess, targets for, for business? I think you're exactly right in that they are tools. If all we said was we have to get to net zero, but there were no pathways, mm -hmm. it would probably take a much longer time. There's incremental learning that comes with the different tools and through sharing a, a common platform like the Science-Based Targets Initiative. And it's really challenging and I feel like sometimes we miss the point of that, having worked <laughs> for a corporate who has tried to set science-based targets in the past. It is really difficult to consider global supply chains that are net zero. Yeah. You know, whether you're looking at, in this case, it was fishing vessels and manufacturing and how do you transport goods all around the world with no carbon emissions. Yeah. That is a huge, huge leap. Huge. And, and the Science-Based Targets Initiative does help you start to break it down and conceptualise how you can do that. Yeah. It shouldn't be the ceiling, though. It, it should be yeah. a tool to help you go even further because perhaps once you start on this path, once you start working with different sectors, so in this case it might be the maritime shipping sector when you're starting to look at logistics or at local communities and how they can work in a different way, it should be cumulative rather than just this is the process that we follow. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think having the high level goal of moving whole economies towards net zero is very important. It, mm. it shouldn't be so prescriptive of this is what you must do to get there because we need to leave room for innovation. Yeah, good insights. Um, and just finally, just to touch a little bit more on your, your point around regulation. Do you see regulation, I mean, from what you said, I, I think you do, but see it as a, a lever for change? I do see regulation as a lever for change, but my personal perspective is that that should set the floor, it shouldn't set the ceiling. So to make sure that everybody's coming from the same starting point yeah. and we're all moving in the same direction, that's when you have regulation. In a way, the regulation is providing the guardrails on the road as we're going up the mountain around the curvy path. Yeah. It's not to say how you get there or necessarily how fast. Sometimes it may be saying how fast, but it's the guardrails to make sure that nobody's falling off the sides. Great. Okay, well, I mean, with that, uh, thank you for such excellent insights, Darian, and, and uh, you know, your, your history, um, the, the last 10 years, actually 30 years of working in sustainability, and uh, what you think the, the future holds. Uh, really, really thank you for your time today. And also to our listeners, I hope the conversation sparked something within you to create the change that you want to see wherever you are today. Uh, please join us for our next podcast in October, where I'll be speaking to V. Nguyen, who's the principal strategist at Forum for the Future, the international sustainability NGO that works with business to accelerate the transition to a sustainable future. And also, uh, finally, thank you to the British Chamber of Commerce for hosting the conversation. Thanks, Thanks Ariana. Ariana. It's been great to be here. Thanks. Thank you for tuning into this episode of the British Chamber's podcast. 
Before you go, don't forget to subscribe and why not leave us a rating and review on Spotify, Apple, Google and the other podcast platforms. For more information, please visit our website at www.britcham.org.sg and tune in next time for a brand new episode.